Thank you for joining us for Ask Big Questions, Voices from the Field, the third in a three-part series of educator programs. Today, we have the pleasure of hearing from several teachers and museum educators about ways they're using essential questions or compelling questions in their practice with students. We'll walk, take a moment um, to walk through a, an agenda for the program um, and then dive right into hearing from our um, several guest speakers today. Um, so we have just a quick overview um, of the program, which is what we're up to right now. Um, it will be followed by educator presentations. So we will start with uh, visual arts connections and then move on to our social studies teachers. And then we'll wrap up at the end um, with the Q&A. So feel free anytime throughout the session to add questions you have using the Q&A tool um, or comments. Feel free to use it for comments as well. Um, and we will respond to those at the end of the session and get to as many as possible. Um, so I thought we'd make um, just a few moments for introductions. So my name is Claire Moore. I work with Educator Programming at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And I'm going to turn it over to Emmy. Emmy, you want to say a quick hello? Hi, I'm Emmy Golden, and I work in the Learning Through Art program at the Guggenheim Museum. Fantastic. And we'll hear from Jeff next. Great. Hi, I'm Jeff Hopkins. I'm a teaching artist in the Learning Through Art program at the Guggenheim. Thanks so much, Jeff. And Mary Ellen? Hi, I'm Mary Ellen Daniels, and I'm a social studies teacher at West Chicago Community High School. And thank you for this opportunity. Oh, our pleasure. It's really um, our treat to have you. And last but not least, we have Tracy. Hi, I'm Tracy Middleton. I'm an eighth grade humanities teacher at Desiree's Academy of Arts and Sciences in California. Fantastic. So we are going to um, start with our folks um, at the Guggenheim, our dynamic duo, Emmy and Jeff, and um, they will get us started here. So I'm going to turn it over to Emmy to just share um, an introduction. Yeah, I thought it'd be great to give you a bit of an understanding about the Learning Through Art program before you heard more about essential questions and how teaching artists use them in the classroom. The Learning Through Art program, uh, and Claire, you can move up to the next slide when you can, uh, is a program that highlights the opportunities for teaching artists to enter public school classrooms in New York City and give them really in-depth learning experiences. The program cultivates student activity, creativity by designing sustained, process-oriented art projects that support learning across the curriculum. So we really make sure that what we're doing in art can align with other classroom subjects. Next slide. The basic structure of our program is that one residency is 20 90-minute art-making sessions in a classroom, and we serve students in grades second grade through sixth grade. The projects that we do in the classrooms are planned in conjunction with our teaching artists on the Guggenheim side and classroom teachers and administrators on the classroom side. Each residency matches a teaching artist with a grade, typically three to four classes of elementary school students. We have 15 residencies across the city. We're serving in all five boroughs and serving approximately 1,400 students. So when we talk about exploration, Claire, you can pull it. Perfect. We're trying to think about combining three things to make it a really full service learning experience. So making sure there's connection to the curriculum, using art making techniques and discussing art, as well as making sure there's a connection to self for students through their ideas and beliefs. One of the biggest ways we begin the year is a kickoff day in which we invite the teachers who are involved in the program on site to the Guggenheim so that we can explain to them what our plans are for the year, overview the exhibitions that will be on display, and get students and or get teachers motivated as well as our teaching artists motivated to be serving students throughout the year. And this is a day that really encompasses an opportunity to familiarize the teachers on their end with the kind of art learning and discussions we'll be having in the classroom throughout the year. The second big day we host is a planning day, which gets down to the nitty-gritty parts of curriculum planning, gives teachers a chance to meet with their teaching artists one-on-one, -on -one, both in a meeting space as well as in a studio art-making space, giving them the chance to get some hands-on opportunities with some of the materials their students will use throughout the year. 
And while Jeff will be talking a lot of the middle part of the program that highlights the kind of ways we use essential questions, our year at the program ends with a year with children, an exhibition of student artwork. At the Guggenheim, we take down our Kandinsky paintings and we hang up a gallery of student work that's inclusive of every residency throughout the program. And while we can't always hang work from every single student, we do include student work from every residency and include an image of student artwork on a slideshow for every student that participates throughout the program. That gives a bit of a general background on the kind of programming we have. In addition to the exhibition, during the exhibition, we offer one student docent spot for a student from every school to represent the projects that they've worked so hard on throughout the year. Claire, if you click to the next slide, a lot of our student docents come in and get a full day with us on site, really discussing how they can best represent their artwork to the general public and give them an understanding of what the experience has been like for them as a public school student to have such an ownership and feeling of belonging at the Guggenheim. So 20 art making sessions throughout the year and roughly that runs from October through June and in addition to that the students also visit the museum three times throughout the year, see the variety of uh, exhibitions that we're hosting throughout the year and begin to feel a real level of familiarity and comfort at the museum as though it's a place they really belong. And at that, I'm going to pass things on over to Jeff, who will talk more about the ways that we use essential questions throughout the program. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay, right. <laughs> uh, thanks, Abby. Um, as a teaching artist, I use essential questions to not only plan the whole scope of the 20-week residency, but also to guide some of the the uh, individual projects that happen during the residency. So what I'm going to do is take us through three different essential questions that I've used in the past and how we have actually incorporated them uh, to provide or start other questions, how we've incorporated looking at art inspired by those questions and how students then created their own projects. So the first essential question that I want to share is um, one of my favorites. It's called or we, we came up with this idea of, um, you know, one thing I should say is that we work very closely with the classroom teachers, our, our partners, in order to, to come up with the project ideas and the essential questions. So what I try to do is create a project that is connected to the curriculum that's happening inside the classroom and something that the teachers are, in, uh, they want their students to learn or take away in addition to what they're able to do with them in the classroom. So with this project, we were working with third and fourth graders, and they wanted the students to connect to their geometry curriculum, but also think about the world, the bigger world around them. So we came up with this essential question, how do shapes shape our lives? And the important thing for me with essential questions is that the big essential question somehow leads to other questions. I feel like an essential question is really successful if it cannot be answered simply, if it can't be answered with one sentence or even one paragraph, but instead it actually triggers more questions and more uh, exploration. So, for example, with how to shape, shape our lives, we started kind of big. We thought, how do people interact with shapes? So we looked at shapes around us in the world, which I'll show you in a second. Then we looked at how artists use shapes as part of their, their design process. And then we brought it a little more closer to home and we asked the students to use shapes to design or redesign something important in their world. So uh, Claire, let's move to the next slide. Uh, we looked at a lot of artists um, and the great thing about a question like this is that the type of art that you can look at to be inspired is it's a wide range. We had uh, we looked at furniture. This is a piece by Scott Burton, uh, who works a lot with geometric shapes. Uh, next, uh, another uh, beautiful. I think this is a uh, Ames chair. Um, next, um, looked at uh, works by Noguchi. So thinking about how artists take the idea of shape and then and then make that, uh, make a personal connection to it in their own works. We looked a lot at sculpture because we were going to be creating three-dimensional objects. Okay. Yes. Um, and then there's Saul LeWitt. And we thought about how um, geometry can inspire structure. 
And then we started to explore how and where structure can be found in the world around us. Right, next. So one thing we did was, uh, this is a, a, um, a class where we um, had the students look and find shapes in their environment, in the classroom environment and in the hallways. Then they had to create the shapes with their bodies and photograph each other, creating and making these shapes. And we were really trying to look at and think about um, how do shapes, how, how, how are shapes part of our everyday lives? Okay, next. And then we began this building and design process where students had to think about something important in their lives. All right, next. And uh, we charted out things that we could find in our home or school environments. And the students sketched out ideas for those objects and how shapes, um, how they were constructed in the different shapes. And then the students were, were asked to brainstorm an object that they would want to redesign or change because they felt like they could design it in a better way. Okay? And ultimately, the students created these beautiful little sculptures. Um, this is a new redesign for an Xbox or a PlayStation, I think. Uh, and the students had to think about how they might, uh, what, what might be wrong with the current, or what, they, what problems might exist in the current uh, PlayStation, and then they did sketches and mock-ups and then created these um, little models of what they, how they would redesign it. All right, and next, I think the next one is um, a boat train that um, they, they sort of, they, this was in a school in Red Hook, Brooklyn, right near the water, um, and it was post-Hurricane Sandy, and so there were a lot of issues of the students feeling isolated in their neighborhood. So our question about exploring shapes ultimately opened up to this bigger issue of how shapes could be used to improve a situation in the current in, in neighborhood. So they, um, some of the students worked on transportation ideas because they were feeling kind of um, isolated uh, post Hurricane Sandy in the, the Red Hook area, which is right by the water and it's kind of cut off um, from a lot of the resources that they were used to have. So. Um, the next question was uh, another one I loved. It was, I worked with students in the Bronx, sixth grade students. How do people leave their mark, marks on the world? And this was uh, a question we came up with because the students are in sixth grade in an elementary school and they're leaving uh, at the end of the year to move on to seventh grade. And the teachers really felt like the students were not thinking beyond just their little neighborhood in the Bronx. And they wanted to think about this transition. How could they leave, what marks were they leaving behind on their elementary school and ultimately how would that translate into them doing something new in the future? So this opened up a few other questions. So um, click again, Claire. Um, so we looked at how leaders in the world and the, sc and the school community leave their marks. Um, then we asked the students to come a little more uh, focused on themselves. What do they leave behind? And then, what would be their mark that they would leave on the school as they're transitioning to seventh grade? So we had a lot of beautiful questions that came out of this one big question. That's where I find, you know, the essential question resonates when you when it's when it starts to to translate into bigger uh, or, or other questions. And um, sometimes you feel the question doesn't the essential question doesn't quite work, and you feel stuck or trapped. But when it's expanding, then you then you feel like you've hit on a good question. This question about how do I leave my mark worked really well with visual arts because we could think about marks in the art sense, in the physical sense, looking at drawings or images. Um, these are the students studying the lines of Van Gogh. Um, next, uh, artists who use uh, mark making as part of their um, locations on their work. This is Glenn Ligon. And, um, his mark making is sort of like an editing process. Uh, beautiful drawings. The next one is uh, uh, beautiful drawings by Colwitz and um, how artists use the, the mark and texture of their materials to create a mood or emotion. And next. Um, and then some artists who have left a mark by using marks. Rembrandt, beautiful texture in his, in his, in his um, paintings which have left a mark or a legacy. So we talked a lot about legacy and leaving your mark behind. And next, I think, is Frida Kahlo, uh, you know, an artist who left a mark with painting, writing, 
and and just and her legacy. So we talked a lot about how uh, Mark, the word Mark, has many different different um, way different definitions. Next, and uh, oh. Robert Smithson, who's left a mark, who, you know, left a mark on the earth. So we talked about how marks do not have to, you know, the scale of leaving your mark. Some people leave a small footprint, some people leave a big footprint, but everybody leaves something behind. Yes. So then the students created a series of, of text pieces um, using printmaking and drawing. Um, this is a self-portrait image uh, that we did using um, printmaking. And then the students worked to combine them all into one accordion fold book that would tell the story of, of what they accomplished in elementary school and what they hope to leave or accomplish in the future. So we can go to the next one. Uh, we did a lot of mark making, working with materials, um, exploring texture. Next. And um, a beautiful. Uh, mark making, uh, looking at themselves. We did a lot of self-portraiture since it's ultimately this project was focused on on um, themselves. And next. And uh, beautiful printmaking, beautiful textures in the printmaking. So really thinking about marks in the artistic sense, but then also marks in the, the sense of leaving your legacy. Next. And then ultimately, they created these um, beautiful collages together. Uh, the next question I'll just run through quickly. Um, a, a project I did with third graders um, down in Chinatown in Manhattan. Um, what do landmarks tell us about the people and places around them? The, um, the teachers in this school wanted the students to explore the neighborhood and to appreciate their neighborhood more closely. Uh, they, they felt like the students were taking for granted the fact that there were that they were in a, a beautiful historical neighborhood of Chinatown, and um, they wanted the students to understand why these landmarks were there and how they arrived and what what was their purpose. So this opened up three questions that we really explored: how to build the buildings and monuments reveal history, right? Which landmarks are important to us and why? Like, why do some landmarks end up resonating with people and and um, becoming something that that um, unite a community, and then how could new landmarks honor forgotten history? So our project was having the students design, learn about the history of Chinatown, and then design a new landmark and create a 3D model to honor things that maybe have been forgotten in history. All right, next. So again, we looked at a lot of different artists. Um, we looked at uh, we looked at the neighborhood itself. This is the Manhattan Bridge. The school is located right between the Manhattan Bridge and the Williamsburg Bridge. Right next, I mean this is the Brooklyn Bridge. Sorry, um, and there's the school from the back. So we also explored the school and its environment right near the FDR Highway. Next, um, then we looked at at um, artists who worked in with big site specific sculptures. So there's a Calder piece. And next, um, I forget who did this, but this is, this was, the students love this beautiful, colorful piece. Um, next, and then we began sketching ideas for their own landmarks. So they had to, to research the neighborhood and then come up with ideas for something they wanted to create or build to honor something. All right, next, um, then they began to. They, they made models of the, after they agreed on sketches, they worked in groups to create models. We used um, cardboard structures and then plaster and, and acrylic paint. Next. Um, you know, this is, well, this is the structure in process. Next. Uh, this is a design, actually this is a sketch of the Guggenheim Museum. The students um, went and visited the museum and then viewed the museum uh, from the exterior, thinking about the museum as a landmark, and why did that museum? Why does that museum stand out uh, in its community? Okay, next, and we created some collages uh, of images from the community to build um, as a part of our, our our thought process. Next, and then we created these big, beautiful sculptures. The students, some of them were three or four feet tall and they really took ownership 
over this uh, over these landmarks. They felt, you know, I think this question um, of of landmarks and this essential question really had made a personal connection with them, and they and they took a lot of pride and ownership. And these sculptures just got bigger and bigger and bigger as we went along. Next, and ultimately. Um, I think this is a flow, floating landmark that would be in the East River. Next. Um, this one is a version of the gate uh, that you cross under when you enter Chinatown, but now it's mounted on two tugboats and would be floating in the river. The students really explored a lot of the history of the East River. They discovered that pirates used to live there in the 1600s, 1700s. Um, and they saw the, the river as a gateway to their community that is often ignored. So they designed a lot of monuments that were floating in the East River. So those are two little tugboats at the bottom, and then the gate mounted on top. Um, it's really, really beautiful. I think that's it. That may be our last slide. Oh, and there's some happy students um, at the end of our process. So um, I know an essential question has worked when the students are smiling and happy and it's opened up their experiences rather than making us feel like we're just trying to like, follow this one question to a T. I use the question as a guide, but I try not to be really tied to it and hope that it leads from one question to another. So thank you. That's it. Thank you so much, Jeff, um, for really giving us some wonderful concrete examples about the ways you're using um, questions in your work and in your um, partnerships with schools. Um, next, we're going to turn our attention to our social studies folks, and we're hearing from Mary Ellen Daniels first. Um, so Mary Ellen, I'll turn it over to you. Fantastic. Thank you. And I would like to take art again after seeing that wonderful presentation by <laughs> really. And I think a lot of what Jeff and Emmy shared translates and has a lot of overlap with what we're doing in the social studies. Uh, what you see on the screen here is some new work uh, that the National Council for the Social Studies is engaging in as far as rewriting our national standards. And one of the reasons I use essential questions in my class is because essential questions support student inquiry, as you just saw from Jeff. Um, there are four dimensions to our arc of inquiry um, in this C3 framework designed to prepare students for college, career, and civic life. The first dimension is developing questions and planning inquiries. And I would just like to reiterate what Jeff shared, that good, essential, compelling questions really perpetuate and trigger more questions. So initially, I might be providing questions for students, but the hope is that we train them to sort of come up with their own questions to guide inquiry. Um, we apply disciplinary tools and concepts to investigate those questions. In the social studies, it's civic mindedness, economic uh, decision making, geographic reasoning, and historical thinking. We're using uh, literacy skills to evaluate sources and use evidence to draw conclusions for our inquiries. And then finally, and I think this is the exciting part of this uh, C3 framework, and I think what is happening at the Guggenheim reinforces this, we're doing this so that students can communicate their conclusions in an authentic way and take informed actions. As you saw Jeff illustrate with uh, that compelling question of how do people leave their mark on the world. We've gone through this arc of inquiry. We've investigated using these questions. Now let students communicate those conclusions. In the instance of the Guggenheim, it's through their artwork. As you'll see through my demonstration, it might be through um, public policy action. Um, to show that they have um, understood it and that they're prepared for this college career in civic life. Now what I'd like to do on the next slide is show you a strategy that I use to introduce essential questions. And this strategy is called Zoom In and it's from a great book that um, I uh, recommend to anyone that's in the education field, not just social studies. It's called Making Thinking Visible from Project Zero out of Harvard University. And in Zoom In, it's basically a protocol that asks students to make observations, inferences, and develop questions as different elements of an artifact are revealed. And that artifact, in our case today, is going to be a photograph, but it could be a piece of artwork. It could be an excerpt from a text. It could be a video clip. It could be a political cartoon, an infographic, song lyrics. Really, this, you know, the sky is the limit here. It could be used as an anticipatory set to introduce an essential question, to generate more um, supporting questions, to test knowledge, or even 
you know, prepare to engage in some of this disciplinary concept work. So we're just going to kind of walk and talk through an example of this in action in my classroom with the next slide. What I'll do is I'll show the students a part of an artifact. In this case, we have a photograph. And I'll ask the students, perhaps individually or in small groups, to um, what do they notice? Now, in the case of this photograph, they might say they notice it's in black and white. It seems to be from another era. They see the Coca-Cola sign. They see African Americans, or what they assume are African Americans. They see a white hand on that one gentleman. And then I might ask them, what do you think is happening to make an inference based on what they're observing with this small piece of the artifact? And then what do they wonder? What questions do they have? And then with the next slide, as you can see, I'll show a little bit more of the photograph. What are the new things they notice? How does this shape their thinking? You know, does it answer any of the previous wonderings? And what new puzzles or questions do they have? So through this process, they can see that evidence matters. And the more evidence you have, the more of a clear picture you have of the event that or artifact that you're examining. The next slide just sort of reiterates the point. Again, what do you know for sure? What makes you think so? What do you still wonder? And then finally, revealing the whole artifact to the students with the final slide there. And this is a pretty provocative image that does elicit many questions from students. Um, and so at this point, you know, what questions have we answered? What do they still wonder? And oftentimes their wonderings will lead into that essential question that I want to introduce. In the case of this photograph, it was to introduce a unit on elections and voting and why don't people vote? And so we looked at that question of why don't people vote through many lenses and the students generated their own supporting questions and we went through that arc of inquiry. If you could go back a little bit, Claire, to the previous one, thank you. Um, yep, perfect. Um, the kids used disciplinary concepts of civic mindedness and historical thinking. They used their literacy skills to plan informed action. If you look, um, one of the hypotheses they had about why students don't vote is because they don't have experience. Many of the students in my school are immigrants. They've had bad negative experiences in their previous homelands with voting and suffrage. Um, and so one of their inferences is that, well, people don't know how to vote or they think it's unsafe. Well, their informed action that they took is they joined the League of Women Voters and they had a mock election using the actual voting machines um, and they brought them into our school to kind of give students that experience of this is what voting is like. We had a voter registration drive if you look at the top right picture during our homecoming event where former students and parents and community members were registered to vote because they said people don't vote because they don't know they have to register ahead of time. A lot of, you know, the kids said, you know what, we're not informed. We don't feel like we know enough to vote. So if you look at that picture there that's on the top with the big screen and the students in the audience, that's a, a debate viewing party that we hosted with a partner school in the area where we had over 250 kids there that night live tweeting with students around Illinois watching that debate. We hosted a candidate forum at the bottom left corner there. And uh, perhaps maybe most exciting, um, the, on the football field there, the gentleman that seems to be signing something on the table, that's our former governor signing legislation giving suffrage rights to students at 17 years old for primary elections here in the state of Illinois. That legislation was generated by students who began with that essential question, why don't people vote? Well, they need time to practice suffrage in a safe environment. Maybe if we let 17 year olds participate in primary elections, they'll be more apt to vote in the future. So I use essential questions to support student inquiry from questioning to informed action. So if we go to the next slide, another reason why I use um, essential questions is to provide an authentic context to acquire and practice literacy skills. And you can see there are some of the common core literacy skills for speaking and listening, reading, and writing. And you can see through what um, Emmy and Jeff introduced and through that little project that I just went through, how kids 
practice their speaking and listening skills. They're practicing their reading skills. They're practicing their communication, their writing skills through this authentic inquiry. And if we go to the next slide, I just want to introduce to you a great resource, again, for any teacher. I love to share my tools with others. Um, through the Right Question Institute, they have something called the Question Formulation Technique. You can sign up for the Educator Network, and they have all sorts of training materials for this that help students generate um, great, essential, and supporting questions. So it's a very elegant protocol. If you go to the next slide, basically students will be given an artifact. Once again, here's an artifact I used in my class of what's happening in the Ukraine. And using that prompt, if you go to the next slide, I had students use the question formulation technique to generate questions using that artifact as their prompt. In small groups, they generated questions following these four basic rules. And um, after they generate the questions um, using these four rules, I then teach them, if you look at the next slide, how to analyze the questions as being either open or closed. And discussing a little bit about the advantages and disadvantages of each type of question. And then what we did is we used the questions they generated in class on the next slide to engage in some inquiry, some further inquiry. We used that prompt of that question of that picture in Ukraine and the questions we generated to prepare for a live video conferencing we were having with students in Ukraine about what makes our communities unique. So after they generated the questions using the question formulation technique, they identified questions that they felt needed to be investigated before we had that live video conference. Um, we did some research to address some of those questions, so we had a good foundation to engage in conversation with our um, brothers and sisters in Ukraine. And then we generated even more questions using this technique to facilitate that global dialogue. So if you look at the next slide, it kind of illustrates the students on the left that they're in my classroom doing the question formulation technique, generating questions, generating great supporting questions. And then on the right, those questions led to global dialogue. It prepared for them to engage in inquiry, live inquiry, using technology with students in Ukraine about what makes our communities unique. And then the final slide, basically essential questions promote 21st century skills. This is a slide from the Partnership for 21st Century Skills, a consortium of business leaders, talking about what they're looking for in our graduates today. And they're looking for things like critical thinking, collaboration, cooperation, creativity. And these are all things that through the Guggenheim, their art program, or through the C3 framework, we're eliciting using these essential questions. The next slide, we kind of finish up here. And we use these essential questions to support a cohesive, spiraling curriculum. I've been teaching 25 years at Community High School a quarter of a century, people. And since I started teaching, I have 25 years of history, more to teach than when I started. How do I make decisions of what to cut and what to, what to keep? How do I focus my instruction? Great essential questions help you do that. Um, and I just want to leave you with some contact information I think is on the final slide here. There we go. Um, so if you have any questions about the techniques or some of the things I went over today, 10 minutes goes like nobody's business, um, feel free to contact me. And if you want more information about that voting investigation that I briefly went over, uh, Diana Hess in a recent article in Social Education um, did a great overview of that project um, in an article called Should Schools Teach Students to Vote? Yes. So you can look that up and get even more details. So again, thank you for this opportunity. And I look forward to seeing what Tracy has to share with us further about social studies. Thank you.
Mary Ellen, thank you so much um, for that fantastic presentation and just really showing how you went from inquiry to these concrete kind of social actions. It's so powerful. Um, before we head on to Tracy, I just wanted to remind folks that are watching the broadcast that you're welcome to add questions you had about any of the presentations or other things you'd like to ask our speakers today using the Q&A app. Um, it's a, it's a little blue button um, with a Q and an A, so feel free at any time to add questions. And I'll go ahead and turn things over to Tracy. Thank you. Um, Mary Ellen, you set me up perfectly. Um, I highly suggest that you invest in the C3 framework, making thinking visible, and the right question. Um, all three of those are basically the foundation of what I do in my social studies class. Um, when planning my social studies units, I do use the C3 framework. And like Mary Ellen said, there are four dimensions. And um, the one that I start my unit off with is dimension number one, and that is the um, planning, uh, asking questions and planning inquiries. And I give my students the compelling questions, um, but I want them to come up with supporting questions. So what I do is I give them the theme of the unit and the compelling question. For the compelling question, I create a question that has multiple answers because I want my students to understand in the history there are multiple perspectives and not one perspective is the right one. Um, once, once students have the theme and the compelling question, I give them an interesting image to analyze, and it is an image that brings up a lot of questions like the one that is on your screen right now. Um, I also give my students a See, Think, Wonder graphic organizer, which I created from the Making Thinking Visible uh, book that Mary Ellen talked about. And um, from there, I ask students to develop some questions they need answered before they can answer the compelling question. So once students have shared their questions with one another, I create a chart of supporting questions that students have generated. And I collect them from all of my social studies classes. Then I create a chart and I post the questions on the wall throughout the unit. So what I would like to do is kind of, kind of give you an opportunity to walk through this process with me. So if you could go back to the John Gast painting, that's where we'll start. There you go. Um, many of you are probably familiar with this painting. It is John Gast's uh, America's Progress. And so what I, the kids have their See, Think, Wonder chart in front of them. And so what I want you to do, you're going to step back in time and you are going to be, you're going to be a middle schooler at Del Dios Academy of Arts and Sciences. So what I want you to do is I want you to just look at the image and I want you to just just use the Q&A button and just type everything that you see. Not what you think, but what you see. What are, the, what are the images that you see? So go ahead and start looking and start typing. Is anybody having a problem? I know that somebody's having a problem typing. Okay, I see a wagon buffalo. The one, the one thing that my students always see is I see an angel flying across the sky carrying a book. Gotcha. Um, some of my students, um, they'll, they'll look at the Native Americans on the left and they'll just say there's some Native Americans, they're looking behind them. They'll notice that the sky is light on the right, but dark on the left. They'll notice the different sets of railroad tracks. They'll notice the wagon. Um, there's mountains in the left and the body of water on the right. Um, they'll see the bear, and they'll notice that the bear is looking backwards. And so um, I have the kids just write down everything that they see. And then sometimes we go into the I think. 
and this is where the students just write what they think is going on. And they'll say things like, um, the Native Americans, they're, they're looking behind them. They're looking at the people following them. Um, you'll see the bear. The bear is afraid of the people. Um, you'll see people moving west. You'll see this woman, she is spreading light as she moves across the west. So they'll, they'll put a lot of what they think in there and um, validate everything that they think. Once we've gone through that process, then they write down what they wonder. And a lot of kids will say, well, I wonder, what is that that she is carrying? Um, I wonder, where, where are the buffalo going? I wonder, um, I wonder about the um, boats in the background. Where are they going? I wonder what that bridge is. Um, so they'll write down all of their wonders. And then once they have, once they have done that, um, I have them share with their neighbors. And so if they're, my kids are grouped into um, pods of four. So they'll share, their, they'll share their wondering with everybody. And then um, I give them, I remind them of the compelling question. And the compelling question for this unit is, is more better? And then um, I ask them, what questions do you need to know in order to answer the compelling question? So then this, I just give them a time to just write, sorry about that, um, I give them an opportunity to just write as many questions as they can. And then once, once we've done that, then we um, share the, then I we share out, I write them on posters and throughout the day I'll keep, I'll just keep track of all of their posters. So if you go to the slide that has the student questions on it, there we go. As you can see, some of the questions my kids came up with were, why did America expand west? What role did Manifest Destiny play in westward expansion? Um, what was the benefit of expansion? Was the benefit of expansion worth the cost? And um, we do we do do a lot of economics in my social studies class as well as geography, civics, and history. And then, you know, what are the negative effects of manifest destiny and expansion? What role did technology play in the success of westward expansion? Was expansion good for everyone? And as they can see in the image, that expansion wasn't good for the Native American. Um, it was good for others. So. That's pretty much the process that I use for just getting kids into the unit, getting them interested about our unit. And I found this to be a great way to get students interested. And since the supporting questions are student generated, there is much more buy-in to the unit. And I also weave inquiry through my unit as students research primary and secondary sources looking for the answers to their questions. And I use the techniques that Mary Ellen talked about, the right question formulation technique. And um, I use a lot of these strategies from making visible thinking. And um, I have found that my students, our students are naturally curious. And so inquiry just, just, inquiry just brings that out of them. And in my work with other teachers throughout my district, we're working on Dimension 1 of the C3 framework right now. And um, one of the teachers that I'm working with, she was, in a, she was in the beginning of the unit, and the kids were just not into it at all. And so she told me that she just decided to just throw out a compelling question. And immediately, it grabbed her students' attention and they just went for it. And um, I've noticed that when I bring inquiry into my classroom, my, my behavior problems, they've gone way, way down. Because the kids, like I said, the kids are naturally curious. And this inquiry just kind of feeds that curiosity. 
Thank so, you so much, Tracy. You're welcome. Wow, so we've had some really interesting examples from all of our speakers, and I wanted to share um, just a couple of examples that were generated during our on-site um, learning lab. So teachers who tuned in for the very first session um, of this three-part series um, came to the museum, so folks living in, in the local um, New York area, to spend a day thinking about how questions might be integrated in their practice and generating some ideas. Um, so I'm going to share just a couple of examples of things that were generated, and I'll start um, by sharing um, a bit about the way we started the day. Um, so just to give teachers who hadn't been using compelling questions or essential questions, um, in their practice, we started with um, gallery experiences about an hour to an hour and a half um, that really explored a question, so kind of positing this idea, what if trips um, to uh, on a field trip or a trip to a museum was reframed through a question, that the whole experience was really um, all linking into that one big idea. And so here's an example of a, one of the questions that was used, what makes a great leader? And some works of art from across the collection um, representing many different places in the world and moments in time um, that really spoke to that. Everything from George Washington crossing the Delaware um, to Sultan Suleiman's Torah, which is um, it's, a, it's basically a um, symbol that represents his name that was used to sh um, authenticate documents. So this would be on the top of the document, um, really um, kind of vetting that it was authentic. Um, so a broad range of examples there. Um, I'll share another example from the gallery experiences. Um, when is something true and how can we tell or know so again, a cross-section of works from the museum, um, one featuring a scene of John Brown and um, that really differed from some newspaper accounts at the times of the way um, that event played out um, to looking at ancient um, artifacts and really um, thinking about all kinds of issues from point of view to um, conservation science and, and ways we can learn about works of art. So after participating in these gallery experiences, teachers really rolled up their sleeves and did some deep thinking about their own curriculum needs and the students that they work with. And um, they, each teacher generated a question um, that would reframe a unit of study that they already taught around a question. And then we essentially crowdsourced ideas for related resources and works of art um, that might tie into that investigation. Um, so this is um, two examples. What makes a great um, relationship, which I just loved as an idea, as a question. And here um, we have a Dogon couple um, sculpture as one example of a work of art that might connect to that. And then we also had um, another person who added, um, what does the environment, um, or how does the environment affect what artists make? And you see several works from around the world. Um, that they added. So teachers essentially posted their questions on the wall and the group went on basically a gallery walk and added stuck up works of art. So each teacher had one work of art and on the back it had information about the work of art. So they made suggestions and then also wrote ideas um, for other connections, whether it was a text or a video or an article that might be appealing. Um, so here's another example, how are beliefs communicated through art and works of art from across the collection area, showing um, different takes on that. So this is an art teacher. And then one last example, how can images affect change in society? And here the teachers have written a range of suggestions for resources. Um, everything from a Norman Rockwell work to photos of Ferguson, the uh, film of the Selma March, um, photos of the Little Rock Nine, 
uh, v Vietnam um, versus embedded journalists in Iraq. So a lot of really interesting ideas generated by teachers who support a number of different subject areas. And I look forward to hearing how um, these units go as they reframe them through questions. So I'm going to go ahead and open the floor um, to questions, if anyone has questions who's been tuning in. And as I do that, and again, you, um, I'm going to share a couple more examples that Jay McTie, who was in our very first session, a conversation with thought leaders shared from art teachers. Um, so again, if you're adding a question, you can use that Q&A button and click on that and type in your question, and we'll respond to those shortly. So a couple more examples of essential questions, and depending on your screen size, it may be hard to read, so I'll go ahead and read them out. What is art? Why do we create art? How does art communicate? What makes art great? Where do artists get their ideas? How is feeling or mood conveyed through <coughs> art? Can color affect mood? And what ways has in technology enhanced how we create art? And how do artists use tools and techniques to express ideas? Um, this question is really um, thinking about that process of reflection of how does feedback affect performance, um, which is a really different angle, not taking on the content per se, but pro thinking about process. And another question, how do the performing arts reflect as well as shape culture? And a last example, how can artists repurpose different materials to make things new? So I'm going to take a look to see if we have any questions um, so far. And it looks like we're still waiting, so don't be shy. Feel free to ask um, a question if you have one. Um, and in the interim, I'd love to hear um, if from our various presenters if there was anything you noticed as um, the other facilitators were sharing that either resonated with you or that kind of pushed things in a new direction um, that you found interesting. So feel free to share any ideas or um, reflections you have. I think, honestly, I was so surprised at how many connections there were between our social studies colleagues and the art connections that we make. Uh, the idea of a see, think, wonder, I always think about being done in terms of a piece of artwork or an image that we're using in the galleries, and yet I can see the clear correlation of how important that could be to use an image either from a news event of the past or from something else to make those social studies connections. I guess I'm just impressed in how many different ways the same processes can be applied to other subjects. You know, to, to build on that, Emmy, I'm part of a humanities department. So actually in our building, art, music, and social studies were all together in one division. Ah. And so we do intentionally, because we are together in one division, we see a lot of that, that overlap. And I, I also want to reiterate what Tracy kind of really talked about is the importance of student voice. Um, the civic mission of schools, where they talk about the civic six proven practices of civic education, talk about the importance of um, student voice. And you know, and when Tracy talked about those students really just getting engaged with that compelling question, you're sending that message that we honor student voice and we welcome questions. You know, something happens between kindergarten and first grade where they're just question machines and they get to high school and it's like out of Ferris Bueller's day off where Bueller, Bueller, you know, you're asking a <laughs> No, no one's registering, right? Somehow, kids get this idea that it's unsafe to ask questions. And that's really dangerous, quite frankly, for our democracy. We want, an, you know, we want an electorate. We want, a, we want a society where people feel informed to ask questions. And asking good questions is an art. We need to practice it in safe environments so that they can ask good questions to their doctors for health care or as they're applying for a job to make sure it's a good fit, or of their university prof professors, or to advocate for themselves. So question, good questions don't happen in a vacuum. And I think that's really something that's really evident using that right question as, um, 
tech, right question institute, you know, question formulation technique is kids learn how to ask good questions and it's empowering to them. Yeah, I think it's also important for them to see us asking questions and for them to understand that we, as, as educators, we are not all-knowing uh, people in front of the room and that we are exploring the question with them and that we are uh, aligned with them to explore these questions and that it's okay for adults to not know everything and to ask questions. And I think the more we, we model um, you know, exploring and being excited by these questions, it makes it okay for them to ask questions and maybe ask questions that they won't necessarily find the answers to. Sometimes and often these great essential questions don't lead to an answer, they just lead to more questions and I love to leave them with the feeling that that's okay. I, I agree with you. I, when I, I get kids in the beginning of eighth grade and they're afraid to ask questions and they feel like if they ask a question it's going to be a stupid question and I, I tell them there are no stupid questions there are some off the wall questions but that's okay because we are we, we there are some of us who are very off the wall thinkers and so it's important to validate your students questions because once they feel that their questions been, has been validated they're going to begin to ask more questions I was curious for those people who are thinking about trying this out in their practice and haven't done it before, of what words of advice you would give them? And that can be to anyone um, on the panel today. Well, just jump in. Um, I'm known for just going in all in, trying something, and the first time you may fail. But, but I pretty much guarantee you that with this whole questioning, um, you're not going to fail. Um, one of the teachers that I work with, she was kind of frustrated in that the kids ask questions, but the kids don't ask the questions where they need to be to learn the material. And um, so my question to her is, is there something that you really need to teach or can those kids questions lead you into thinking about your curriculum in a very different way. And I, and I think that's the hardest thing to let go of is you have in your mind where you want the kids to go, but they don't know what you're thinking and so they're not necessarily going to be asking the right kinds of questions at first. Um, and so you just have to be willing to, to be flexible and see where their questions lead. Yeah, I would say, uh, you know, coming up with an essential question is really difficult. And uh, sometimes it just takes one, sh like one change of a word or shifting the, si the question around a little bit to change it from really closed into really open-ended. And it might just be changing a word from how to might or how might this be um, to, to use some terminology that's a little more open. Uh, but, uh, you know, I always try to allow myself room to, to change the question if it's not working and to just make adjustments and say, you know what, this question, I thought it was going to be really open, I thought it was going to lead to more questions, but it seems to be closing us in. So let me back up and, and it's actually going to be beneficial for the students to see me deal with sort of adjusting or changing our, our approach. and. Um, and then to make changes to the question as we go along and just see it as, as a whole process that we're all engaged in together. Thanks so much. So it is just about 5 o'clock now, and I wanted to be sure to thank all of our fantastic presenters today for sharing these great ideas um, and really concrete examples that um, people can think about as they um, consider ways of integrating compelling questions or essential questions in their practice. 
I just want to remind those of you um, who are viewing who may not have had a chance to catch the very first session um, that the recording is available online and I have a um, URL here and it's also on the Hangout event page um, so if you don't want to um, or jot that you know fairly long um, URL down it's right there on the event page for today and that session is kind of an introduction about the whys um, should you use essential questions uh, or compelling questions and some tips for generating those so do go back if you didn't have a chance to watch that and take a look um, I hope everyone has a fantastic evening and again thank you so much um, I really appreciate your insights today